Hello and welcome to Life Lessons with Biblical Answers. My name is Robbie Harmon, and today we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 22 in our Bible study series. Uh, this video is just one of a number of sermons, video shorts, and lessons that we have on our channel that help encourage and prepare you and others for your daily journey with Jesus Christ. Our mission is to provide a free service to anyone who has questions about God's Word and Jesus Christ. And we want to invite you to be a part of that mission. There's a couple of things you can do real simply. You can like, share this video with your friends on social media or at your congregation. And don't forget to subscribe and click that bell so that you can get the latest updates on the lessons that are available to us. Also, feel free to, um, um, if you have questions, to share a prayer request or to find a Christian congregation near you, feel free to write me anytime. Uh, it's uh, facebook.com slash brother Robbie, all one word. We we'll look forward to seeing you and talking with you firsthand and uh, just to get that word out. You see, we are Christians and we're supposed to be here for one another and encourage one another at all times, not just when it's good or when it's bad, but every moment of every day, in season, out of season. I take that challenge very seriously. And I want to encourage you to do the same. Let's keep building up the body and serving the Lord together as we get into our study. All right, so Acts chapter 4 continues where we left off last week with Acts chapter 3. And you recall that Peter and John encountered a man who was lame from birth. And they looked at him straight in the eye and told him to get up and in the name of Jesus to walk, to rise and walk. And they pulled him up. He got up. He was healed. He jumped around. He praised God, and that drew quite a crowd. And a lot of the people were coming to look and see what was going on, what all the commotion was about, and who was doing all this healing. Peter uses the opportunity to preach to the multitudes and state it wasn't them, but actually the name of Jesus that healed this man. And on top of that, this was the Jesus whom they crucified, but God raised up from the dead. Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Moses that a prophet would rise up among that would be just like him. And with that, and they would be blessed. So Jesus is the fulfillment made by God through all the prophets. And this leads us into the chapter that we're going to continue looking at here in this scene. And if we go and look at Acts chapter 4, verse 1, we start reading here. Let's get a look at that closely. And as they be, were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Peter then said, filled with the Spirit, Rulers of the people and elders, If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, who God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that you rejected, the builders which had become the cornerstone. And this is salvation, and there is salvation in no other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they heard this and saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated common men, and they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the men, seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that is a notable sign that has been performed through them, is evident 
to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. We can't deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or to teach all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot speak, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Whew. Mercy. That's a powerful piece of scripture. And we can learn quite a bit from it. I want you to first realize, though, that uh, I want you to notice that when we read in Acts chapter 4 what takes place while Peter and John are teaching here, look carefully. We have a tendency to think that Peter and John have walked away and that the Jewish leaders made a, a quiet arrest. But the truth is, that's not the case. Not at all. It's very public. Peter and John are in the middle of preaching Jesus uh, to fulfill, uh, was, as he was the fulfillment of the prophets and the prophecies that had come. And when notice had come in, when they started coming, it says here the priests, the captains of the temple guards, and the Sadducees confronted them. It was a face-to-face. -face. This would have been very disruptive to all these men as they moved through the crowd to get to Peter and John. So why did the priests and the Sadducees care about Peter and John? Well, we see that they were provoked and greatly disturbed because they were proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now, if you notice, the Sadducees are there. Now, if you don't know anything about what the Sadducees believe in, they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe anybody can resurrect. They believe you're dead, you're dead. Very secular. It is very interesting to note that even there's no mention of the Pharisees at this point, but the Sadducees who deny the possibility of resurrection were there very openly. They are also the controlling power in the Sanhedrin Council. So that means that we have got a situation here where the Sanhedrin being like, it'd be like Democrats and Republicans in a Congress. You have certain groups of people that are in charge sometimes and certain and the other group and the other party is in charge other times. Well, that's exactly what's going on here in the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is very political. They're very religious, but they're also very political. The Sanhedrin met on the grounds of the temple complex. This commotion that Peter and John had caused would have only taken yards and maybe feet away from where they were standing. And Peter and John were teaching in front of the very authorities that had the power to arrest them. They had no fear. Therefore, the priests and the Sadducees have the temple guards arrest Peter and John and throw them into prison till the next day. But do you know who else was with them? Do you know who else was with them at that point? The lame man. The lame man was with them. They took him into custody as evidence. So he was there with them. Notice that the scripture says that the reason they remained in prison until the next day was because it was already evening. This is according to Jewish law that no trials be held at night, a law that was broken in the arrest and trial of Jesus, if you recall. The, this arrest was probably not surprising to Peter and John, though. Jesus had predicted that his apostles would endure such treatment. He says, but you be on guard. They will hand you over to Sanhedrins, and you will be flogged in the synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings because of me as a witness to them. And the good news must first be proclaimed to all the nations. So when they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand what you will say. On the contrary, whatever is given to you in that hour, say it, for it is isn't you speaking it's the holy spirit that's what he says in mark 13 9 through 11 to these apostles very quickly after jesus's death the apostles are expecting that which jesus prophesied so what is the people's response 
What, how do they respond to such a thing? Well, you can imagine if you had been in amongst that crowd and you heard Peter preaching, you would witness this lame man getting healed who has been walking, leaping, and praising God the whole time. However, you know, you would also witness Peter and John's arrest and seen them put in prison. How would you respond to that? What would you do? Perhaps some of us would go home. Clearly listening to these men was kind of dangerous. How would you who I mean who would want to follow Peter and Jesus after they've been thrown or Peter and John after they had been thrown in prison all night and would stand trial the next day? Who would want to follow them, right? <laughs> we see many believe the words of Peter that spoke that day that came out. Let us see that the faith of these people is greater than this, for Peter and John were not the only ones arrested, as I said. While we do not know if the if arrested or if he simply went to be with them by their side, the lame man went with them. It says in verses 9 and 14 there, he was there. Perhaps the temple guard also arrested the lame man so as the people would quit talking about him. Let's hide this and put it over here. Keep it hush, hush. Perhaps that's what took place. If so, how brave these people and the multitudes to still believe in the name of Jesus and become Christians. And if the lame man was not arrested, what great faith he exhibited to go with them, to back him up, to back them up. Going with Peter and John because of the great work that had been accomplished through them and upon him. He is willing to go to trial with Peter and John because what had been done to him by the power of Jesus. What a marvelous scene. And what a powerful statement to us as Christians that we are looking and seeing truth being lived out. Not just through the apostles, but by those that have been affected by, Je by the name of Jesus and by the proclamation of Jesus. Let's keep reading on and see what we say, see what it says. And looking at verses 5 through 22, on that next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem. Look at what that says there. They're starting to come back together again. They're a little anxious. Obviously, they're nervous because they don't know how to respond to this. What, what are we going to do? How are we going to fix this? They start interrogating them. The next day comes and they start interrogating them. The rulers and elders and scribes, the whole high priest family assembled in Jerusalem for this trial. Just to keep the image in your mind, the Sanhedrin council numbered about 70 folks. Okay, so you have about 70 folks there. You can see how greatly outnumbered and how intimidating that might be to Peter and John. But that's not the case, is it? Peter and John must stand before that council and ask, By what power or in what name have you done this? They want to know where Peter and John received their authority. Was it by some demon? Was it because of some show? Was it, was it by Jehovah God? Was it by the great I Am? Was it by Yahweh? They wanted to know. And this is a proper question. Who gave you the power to heal this lame man? Who gave you the authority for what you are doing? Because it certainly didn't come from the Sanhedrin. They're looking and saying, it didn't come from us. <laughs> and if it didn't come from us, we got a problem here. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit as promised by Jesus and begins his defense. But do you see that that is not much of a defense for themselves as it is another opportunity to reach out with the name of Jesus? Peter and John do not appeal to the law. The law does not give them freedom. But they go and they say that we have been freed by the name of Jesus Christ, whom you crucified. This is about having a chance to teach the Jewish leaders the truth about Jesus Christ, the truth concerning the gospel. Peter begins by pointing out that if the only reason they are standing trial is because of the good deed done to this disabled man, then know that the work was accomplished by the authority of, Je of Jesus the Messiah. But that is not quite how Peter says it. Peter says that they 
healed this lame man by the authority of Jesus the Messiah, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead. See, Peter says that they killed Jesus, who is the Messiah, but God raised him back to life. The gospel doesn't change. The message doesn't change. No matter who is being confronted with it, the message is clear. The message is resounding. And this is causing people to get very nervous. Peter quotes Psalm 118.22 and applies that to the message of Jesus. The Jewish leaders were to be, built, to be the builders of the nation. All right, not the rejected, not 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 them rejecting the stones to whom God has made the cornerstone. Further, it is no other authority given to people by which mankind can be saved. There is no other name, no other name that can bring salvation to people, that can bring hope to people, that can bring healing to people than Jesus Christ. Salvation is in no other person. Peter, Peter here is saying that they crucified the one and only Savior of Israel. They will not be, there will not be deliverance found in any other person. There is no future Messiah. You killed the only one that was considered the Holy One of God. You killed the Messiah. He is telling them straight out. The statement made by Peter is just as true today. There is no other name by which we can be saved. None. Zero. When Peter said those words, he meant that there is no other authority where salvation can come from. None. Do, to do something in somebody's name is to perform that action by their authority. Jesus is the authority to salvation. There is no salvation found in Buddha, Muhammad, Islam, and any other person or religion that is not teaching Jesus as a son of God raised from the dead. To proclaim salvation in any other name to stay is fruitless and will not save souls. Period. Now, some people might say that's an arrogant statement. It's not based on arrogance. It's based on the confidence we have in the word of our Savior. He said he would return, and he did. He overcame the grave, and he also said that he would return again for his church. We believe that emphatically. We believe that to be the utmost truth that Jesus will return. But we have to accept him on his conditions in this lifetime first. We have to accept the truth that he came here first. And that first time he resurrected. He was, he was crucified, he died, he was buried, and he resurrected by the name of God, in the name of God, as the son of the living God, as the Messiah, as the means by which we are saved. There is no other name. And Peter is emphasizing this to a group of 70 people who absolutely cannot stand the name of Jesus. They have fought against Jesus for three years previous, and they are now seeing these men come out of the woodwork and start shaking the world up in the name of Jesus. We could learn something from that today, too. How many times have we shaken the world up in the name of Jesus? No, I think very hard about that sometimes. Am I doing enough to get the name of Jesus out to every person? Every day that crosses my mind. Because I want, to, I want people to see Jesus in my life. I don't want them to see me. I want them to see Jesus. Jesus is the only reason I'm alive today. He is the only hope I have today. He is the only need I have to have today to fulfill. And that means I've got to be in him. And I've got to be exploring and seeking. How can I help my Savior today? Everything else will trickle down. Your family, your job, your life, your finances, everything. If you just are willing to submit to God and submit to his Christ, which is Jesus. Are you willing to do that? 
and submit to the Son. See, I can go on and on and on all day just like that. But what it takes is believing it first. And that is what Peter is appealing to here with the Sanhedrin. Now, the response of the Sanhedrin is certainly interesting after such a powerful speech has been made by Peter. The council observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized these were just uneducated, untrained men. As was mentioned in Acts chapter 2, aren't these men all Galileans? Well, that was kind of an insult because all these people that were from Galilee, all these people that were Nazareth, from Nazareth, nothing good ever came from Nazareth is what the old saying was. These people are just simple folk. They're average Joes. They don't have a Bible degree. Why are they coming in here? How are they able to do this? They haven't gone to Bible college. They don't have the, the learning and the know-how to be able to proclaim this word. But they do. They realized they were uneducated men in the law of Moses, but the council also realized that these men had been with Jesus. And perhaps verse 14 is my favorite part of this whole thing. And since they saw the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in response. <laughs> they had to keep their mouth shut. They had to stand by there. What can be said? Here is this lame man who is standing right there. He, he can't be denied by him. How in the world can you? No, that ain't happening. He's been sick for, he just been sick for a couple of years. No, no. In fact, when you go to the closing of the verses there, you find out this man is over 40 years old. So he is somebody, everybody knows that has been lame from every single day of his life. He's not just somebody that's passing by and playing a prank on people. This is a legit, true case of healing. And so, you can't say anything. G Peter and John claim in the name of Jesus that the council killed about a month and a half back. This man who is lame now is walking. It's in his name. What are you going to say about it? How are you going to defend it? You can't. So what does the council do? What are they going to say? Well, the first thing they do is they send Peter and John out of the courtroom and begin to discuss the matter among themselves. Now, I want you to notice what they say to each other. What should we do with these men? For an obvious sign evident to all who live in Jerusalem has been done through them, and we can't deny it. <laughs> this should have been enough. If the evidence is undeniable and they ought to believe what was said then, Shouldn't they respond with a positive message? Oh, no, no. The hard-hearted priests, the Sadducees, and the elders would not change their hearts. You see, they don't want this to be true. They know that if Jesus is in charge, they have done wrong in the sight of God. A lot of us have pride, and we don't want to let go of those things that define us according to what we think defines us. And that's exactly how these guys are. They are allowing their anger, their malice, their hard-heartedness to take control. And so the council sends Peter and all out, and to prevent them from spreading all this, they call them back in, and they call and they say, Look, we realize this has happened, but we're not going to see this anymore. We are commanding you not to preach the name of Jesus or teach at all in the name of Jesus. We must, we must realize that the threats of the Sanhedrin were not empty, not at all. It was this very council that handed Jesus over to Pilate to begin with. This is the council that had the power of the Jewish nation behind it. When the text says the council threatened Peter and John, we need to envision how real those threats were. These were not just veiled threats. They weren't empty promises. These were events that were going to cause people's lives to be hurt or damaged in some way, whether imprisoned or murdered. They were threatening their lives if they keep preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus Christ. And that was something that they could not have. But I want you to notice how Peter responds to this. You see, Peter calls upon the Sanhedrin's ability to judge matters. In essence, Peter is saying, you all are judges. Decide this matter. Is it right in the sight of God to listen to you or to listen to God? Who you think I'm going to listen to? That's a pretty powerful argument. Who are you going to listen to? Men 
or God. Now, I know a lot of people would say, well, if you're listening to God, you're delusional. Are we? We read the scripture, and if we accept God's word as what it is, God's word, the infallible word of God, we take that as instruction, and we should apply that to our lives daily. So we need to live by that truth. That's exactly what Peter is saying here. Peter has noticed that the council cannot refute that this miracle was done by the power and the name of Jesus. It's undeniable. So Peter says to them, Who should we listen to, you or God? Peter continues by saying, For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Basically, how can you stop teaching about this? Because a notable miracle has been performed. Something has been done in the name of Jesus Christ, and you are wanting us to silence that? Not only the miracle of the lame man, but the miracle that God raised Jesus from the dead? How can they not speak about these things? Verse 21 says that the council threatened Peter and John further. Again, we need to realize the severity of these threats. The severity of these threats these two men have been receiving. These were not empty threats or vain complaints. These men were be, could be punished by death. And Peter and John knew that. But what could they say that Peter and John had done against the law of Moses absolutely positively nothing nothing could be said because the people were all giving glory to God over what had been done they were giving glory to God over every piece of the miracle that had been done in that temple that day they could not kill Peter and John for blasphemy or conjure up any charge because the event caused the people to praise God not men, not Peter, not John, not the lame man, but God. That's what the scripture does. That's what the gospel does. The gospel points us back to God. Thus, this truly was a notable miracle. So, how can we apply that to ourselves today? Should we listen to God or listen to men? Now, you all, if you've, if you've listened to me very much in the past, you've probably heard me say this a couple of times. Don't take my word for it. Don't listen to me. Listen to what the Word of God says. Listen to what the Bible says. Listen to what the gospel message says. Don't listen to me. Whatever you do, don't take my word for it. Look for it yourselves. Friends, should we listen to God or should we listen to men? The authority rests with God and not with people. All I am is a messenger. All I am is the guy that's delivering the message that God has laid upon my heart. And through his word and through his gospel, I point it back to him. That's it. That is how we should respond to that. Should we listen to men who claim that the world was created by natural forces over long spans of time and that God had nothing to do with it? Or should we listen to the folks that say God spoke it into the existence, even if it only took six days? Should we listen to men who claim that hell is only reserved for the really bad of this world? Or to the God who said that all who do not obey him have disobeyed him and will be punished? Should we listen to uh, men who claim that salvation is merely praying certain words or coming to him by letting him into your and letting God into your heart? Or should we say repent, believe, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized? That's what God's word says, shouldn't we? Peter and John did not cave into the pressure of these powerful men. He didn't go with what the mob wanted. Peter and John went with what God wanted. The council said that Peter and John had their teaching all wrong. Peter and John said, we need to listen to the word of God and not to men. Those honest in heart will always realize that we must listen to God and not what men are telling us. If any man says anything that is contrary to what we see in the scriptures, then we cannot listen to that man but must obey God. God. We should seek God's wisdom through his scripture. Salvation is found in the power of Jesus' name alone. If 
if we go and think that we can find salvation in any other book, in any other method, whether it's going and practicing yoga, whether it is going and thinking about uh, how much good I can do if I go out and just give the charity all day in my life, or I'm just naturally a good person, or I go and I seek a, seat, a self-help book to try to make myself better. If you're going into any other name or any other religion or any other place, then you are not living where you need to be. We cannot find salvation in any other name, especially ourselves. We need to trust in the name of Jesus. Let me bring this closer to home. Salvation is not found in our name or authority. Period. Most of the religious world, while claiming to follow the scriptures, are actually following their own authority. When we ignore the clear teaching of Scripture concerning salvation, requiring confession, repentance, and baptism, we are claiming that salvation can be found in our own wisdom. That my way of examining this is the right way and not God's way. And that God's way is not absolutely correct. We start living that the Scriptures are not perfect. But the truth is, the scripture is perfect. The scripture is infallible. God's word tells us what we need to do to get to know him. We justify our action based not on the scriptures, but because we think God will not care. You know, when we justify our actions based on that, when it's not in scripture because we think God will not care, it's not a big deal or some other reason, we are putting the balance of power in salvation in our knowledge over Christ's. Let me repeat that. If we are trusting in our knowledge, if we go and say it's not a big deal, oh, baptism, wherever it happens, it's okay, you know, uh, or it's not a big deal, why are we arguing about it? It's secondary doctrine anyway. Or, you know, we don't care about the idea that we need to repent, we need to be changed, we need to be different. Where are we putting our where are we putting our faith? Are we putting our faith in Christ? Are we putting our faith in the very one who offers salvation or are we putting it in to our way of thinking? Our plan of salvation. I don't want our plan. I want God's plan of salvation. And that is how we should look at God's word is this is his plan to use his son as the means by which all mankind can and will be saved but we've got to be willing to look at what that means and since Jesus is the authority we must be saved by his conditions not ours Jesus has all authority and power in heaven and on earth we cannot change to distort that Jesus said what we have to do in order to be saved. Mark 16, 16 says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Jesus it has Jesus has conditions, and they are very, very simple. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. How much simpler is that? You may believe you are a follower of Jesus, but if you have not believed, repented, confessed, been baptized, and walked in the newness of life, have you been? Simply because you question that you don't have to do any of these things? That you can just believe and let Jesus into your heart? You don't even have to change your life. You may continue to live in sin if that's the case. You are not saved because repentance is one of Jesus' condition for salvation. You've got to be willing to repent. And maybe you just think, well, repentance means I just, you know, I confess my sins that I'm doing right now and then I get over it. But what is a sin? You see, repentance isn't just about repenting of your sin. It's about turning your life back over. It is turning your life, giving your life up for Jesus Christ. It's about changing your life. It means to have a relationship with the one you love. It means settling down. I think that's one thing a lot of people don't seem to grasp today of what repentance is. It's like when you decide, I'm going to marry and be settled down for the rest of my days. 
It means you turn back to the one who is able to change you, and that is God. You come to him on his terms. This is his wedding. You are his bride. He is the bridegroom. And what he says is how it needs to be done. You have to come to him on his conditions. We're the ones that are sinning. We're the ones that are to blame, not God. And so God has the right to make his authority known and his conditions when it comes to salvation. How can we go and not believe and not repent and not confess and not be baptized and think we're going to heaven? You're not saved because of what these things do and what each individual thing means. But moreover, you are saved because you obeyed all the conditions. You listened to God. You obeyed our Lord, stated for salvation, to believe, repent, confess, and be baptized, and to live on in the newness of life. You don't take that for granted. It means we have only the conditions of Christ that obey, not of men. If somebody tells you something other than what the Scripture defines and says, well, you can just go out in the woods and confess the name of Jesus, you'll be saved. Is that what scripture says? Or all you got to do is pray this little prayer. Is that what Jesus says? Or you just got to invite him into your heart. Is that what scripture says? You have to read it in the totality, in all of it. It all plays in. It all builds you up. You have to be willing to look at how God has done this. Do we go by our authority or by Jesus's? I'm getting ready to put out a uh, list on my Facebook page that will have verses concerning baptism on it. I know there's a lot of people that ask that for that and ask for questions. Well, how did you get so serious about this baptism thing? I'm going to show you exactly what I did. And it's going to be all in black and white for you. But my thing is I want to encourage you first and foremost First and foremost, I want to encourage you to take time out. Once this gets posted, I'll have a link down here in the description below. Once it gets posted, I want you to take time out, pray, and I want you to read those verses. Not just as they are, but I want you to read them in context. Read them in the context of the entire surrounding verse and see what it says about baptism, what needs to be done in order to be saved. I encourage you not just to look at baptism as the only means of salvation. That's not what I'm saying whatsoever. You do have to believe in Jesus Christ. You do have to repent. That means turn your life over to him. You do have to confess Jesus as the Son of God. You do have to be baptized for the forgiveness of sin and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you need to be willing to go and live in the newness of life. There's no ifs, ands, or buts on it. The scripture's clear about it. And I want to encourage you to study and pray about it. Keep reading the book of Acts. Look at what these next verses will talk about in verses in chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Look at where the scripture leads and where the gospel goes from here. We'll be examining that in more detail. And I want to encourage you. Keep praying for one another and building one another up in the name of Jesus. I know that sometimes that can be very hard. But you're capable of doing it. Keep seeking his face. Keep looking at the scripture. You don't have to have a Bible degree to read the Bible. You don't. Peter and John sure didn't. But they lived with a guy that studied it and knew it, and that was Jesus. He lived what the Bible said we need to do. And his Holy Spirit opened their eyes. His, whole, his Holy Spirit can open your eyes as well, just like it does mine. Just like it does any Christian who calls upon the name of the Lord that wants to be able to be saved and wants to be able to do his will. If you're serious about it, get to know Jesus today. Until we come together to the next appointed time, God bless you and have a great week.